I'll be brief. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Dave Caradini, and I have the privilege of leading the Defense and Faith Committee. We just uh, concluded a series uh, looking at the virtues and the, and, and the pursuit trends and transcendentals of truth, beauty, uh, beauty, and goodness. And we're starting a new series. This one's called Introduction to the Holy Scripture. And the idea behind it is how can we, as members of the order, uh, who are supposed to be as the bylaws and constitution tell us in our own way, exemplary Catholics, how are we supposed to uh, appropriate the riches of Holy Scripture? How do we pray with it? How do we understand it with the mind of the church? And so over the next, we've also looked at the structure of how we've done these talks in the past, which been a lot of priestly talks, which have been great. Uh, and the, the recommendation in the committee was that we could disperse those with lay talks. So over the next, this is going to be a three-year cycle. Uh, the first year, we're looking at the themes of re, uh, creation. Next year, we look at the themes of redemption. And the third year, we look at the theme of sanctification. And we'll have experts, uh, either priests or theologians, come and talk to us about certain aspects of those doctrines. And then we'll also have lay witness talks drawn from members of the order who tell us how their work, how their work in the order um, impacts or is a reflection of that particular doctrine. So very happy tonight that our first speaker is our own and beloved Father Mepino, who is, as we now know, he's a, a, a chaplain of the order. He came in, he learned, I think he told us that, I think it was over in St. Michael's, that he learned the order when he was at uh, the North American College and he was singing in the Grand Master's Chapel, I think at a, at a mass for the Grand Master. So I think that's, you know, wow. I mean, it's hard to beat that. That's like the best way you can get to know the order. And since that time, he has learned more about the order. We've learned more about him. He's come to the chapel. And the talk he's going to give us tonight is called Seeing Through the Eyes of Jerusalem. When he and I were first uh, reading scripture through the eyes of Jerusalem, the idea that I had for the talk is that we would look at how the church makes use of Holy Scripture in her liturgy, at Mass, in the daily office, etc., and then how we as individual Catholics can use the Scripture to pray. Father said, you know, that's good, but do you mind if I do something a little different? It's absolutely not. It's your talk. You should do what you want. And so he's going to work with those themes, but he's also going to speak to us how specifically through the charism of the order, we have special graces that allow us to appropriate the treasures of Holy Scripture, which is why he chose the topic, Seeing Through the Eyes of Jerusalem. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Father Anthony. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle them in the fire of your love. Set forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by that same spirit we may be ever truly wise, and always rejoice in the consolation he brings. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 There are only so many individual homilies that we remember over the course of our lives. We hear hundreds, maybe thousands, and thousands of homilies, but if you sort back through your memory, there are only so many that you can actually pick out and say, I remember exactly this one. And among the homilies dearest to me is one that I heard when I was still in high school, uh, back at Holy Spirit, actually, on the subject of the book of Revelation. And the priest who was preaching on the image of the heavenly Jerusalem told all of us that in the church, in the time of the sacraments, in the time after Christ's resurrection and ascension, the glory of heaven itself had already uh, begun to shine here and now. And he told us that we were already beginning to be surrounded by the splendor of the Lord's presence, of his love, of his victory. All we needed in order to see it was to look at everything around us with what he called Jerusalem eyes. If by grace we looked at the world through Jerusalem eyes, that is, eyes that see the heavenly Jerusalem 
already present with us, we would no longer see only worldly logic, power struggles, plans and desires, sufferings and disappointments, boredom and futility, mixed in with fleeting joys and more or less pleasant distractions, but rather with Jerusalem eyes, we would be able to see the light of Christ's presence, his risen and glorious presence, already in every corner of reality. We'd be able to see the presence even now of the city to come, whose light is the Lamb of God. So with that image in mind, uh, I'd like to talk uh, about interacting with the scriptures as an act of seeing. That's how we're going to look at things tonight. Looking at the scriptures, how do we interact with the scriptures as an act of seeing? And we're going to talk about four things. We're going to talk about how seeing is related to tuitio fide, defense of the faith. What seeing means in the context of scripture. What seeing means for the act of worship. And what seeing finally has to do with obsequium paupetum, or the service of the poor reason I have a whiteboard. I'm better with whiteboards than I am with PowerPoints. I hope that you won't fall asleep too quickly. We will do at least a little bit of Latin, and I promise it will matter. Um, but hang in there. <laughs> Hopefully, by the end of this, not only do we have a better sense of some really fruitful ways for us to approach the scriptures, but also a deeper sense of what it means for us to be members of the Order of Malta, and to have tweets uh, fide and obsequium palpetum as uh, our particular uh, charismata, as it were. So the first thing we want to talk about is I want to uh, talk about this choice to frame the reading of the scripture and interaction with the scriptures as seeing, not arbitrary, not arbitrary, but has to do with the very heart of our, our mission as members of the Order of St. John. So we're going to be looking at tuitio fide first, right? So this noun that we use, we're all ready for the whiteboard. Life's good. We have tuitio fide, right? And we know what this means. What does this mean? Defense, Defense of the faith, right? Tuitio is a really strange word to use for defense. There are lots of options for the word defense in Latin. You might use... Defensio, right? You can read if I write in caps, right, for the most yeah. part. If it's lowercase, I promise it's indecipherable. <laughs> uh, defensio would be the easiest one, which comes from defendere, which literally means, it's a very specific meaning to this word, to fendere something is to hit it physically, is to strike something. Defensio is the act of defending by hitting something until it goes away. That's what defendo means. I defendo by striking something until it departs, until it flees. This is what the Templars do, but we're not Templars. We're the order of Malta. We do something different. Another particular word that we might use would be conservatio. Right? You can see the cognates in all of these. Servatio comes from this word servus, which means slave. So servatio is making myself a slave of something, and that is the way in which I guard it. I guard it by attending to it as carefully as I possibly can, but there is quite literally, in this case I can use the word literally because it is applying, we're talking about words, literally, it is servile. It has to do with slavery, servus. And to conservare something, this is an intensifier. So to conservare something is to defend it by hoarding it away, by being a slave of its beauty, right? By defending it from the outside with every fiber of my being. That's when we engage in conservation work. That's what we're doing. There's another term for defensio that we could use, which would be Munitio, right? Munitio. If you've ever seen a St. Benedict, Benedict medal, mm -hmm. you'll see the verb muniamur, which means uh, that we might be defended. All right? Munitio means to defend by building up. Munus is uh, a word both for gift and burden and for wall. 
right? So I defend something by piling up stuff around it, right? By defend by building up. None of these are the words that we chose, right? We don't defend this way. Our defense of faith is not just about piling up stuff around the center. It's not about hoarding away something precious. And it's not about hitting things until they go away. We chose tuitsu, which means something different. Tuitsu comes from a, a really fascinating verb, a rare verb, in fact. It's not a common verb. It's, again, uh, we'll get there. Tuitsu comes from the verb tuitsu. Any Latin scholars know what tuitsu means? Does anybody know this verb? It's rare. It's not the first verb you use when talking about the thing that it means. Tueor is the verb for looking. Tueor, the, the verb tueor means I look at, I gaze upon, I contemplate. Right? If I'm tueoring, I am watching something. Fixed my gaze upon it. The perfect passive participle, if we remember what those are, is tuitus, or tuitus, right? So this is a thing that has been looked at. So tuitio, quite literally, is the act of making something into a thing that has been looked at, which is how we defend. This is where we get guard and defend from tuitio, right? It's a defense that comes about through watching, through looking, through seeing, through considering, or keeping vigil. It's a defense that comes about through contemplation. So when we, as members of the Order of Malta, not as hospitallers, uh, pardon me, as hospitallers, exactly as hospitallers, not as Templars, goodness, <laughs> uh, not as other people who might defend, our form of defense comes from watching, from looking, from gazing, from keeping vigil, from seeing. The way we defend the faith is by gazing upon the faith ceaselessly, without ever turning our gaze away from the faith. That's how we defend it, it's by keeping watch and fixing our eyes on it. So when I say the way that we want to consider interacting with scripture today has to do with seeing, again, not arbitrary. This is our mission. This is what we do as members of the Order of Malta. If we want to defend the faith, <coughs> we're the ones who see it and look at it and don't turn our gaze away from it. Follow me so far. You made it through one of two portions of Latin. Congratulations. <laughs> hopefully still here. And hopefully still having a good time. Let's talk a little bit about the scriptures. What does it mean to relate to the scriptures by an act of seeing? What am I talking about? There are lots of ways that we as Christians deal with the scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So the scripture has for St. Paul a whole range of immediately practical purposes. The fathers of the church began to teach that scripture has four senses. You may have heard this before, that scripture has a literal sense, an allegorical sense, a moral sense, and then an anagogical sense. Or in other words, scripture tells you a thing that happened, what we should believe about it, what we should do about it, and what we can hope from it, what we can expect from it, right? So then the scripture for the fathers leads to knowledge, contemplation, action, and hope. Of course, the further we go into the scriptural liturgy, uh, literature, the commentaries on the scripture, when we read people like Augustine, or Bernard of Clairvaux, Bonaventure, or John of the Cross, we read that scripture, scripture is more than any of these things. It's this great ocean of meaning, like an endless mine uh, filled with treasure. And no matter how much we take away, there's always going to be more. No matter, which, no matter how much we drink, we can never take it all in. Text 
uh, from the inspired scriptures can and does mean one thing, a hundred things, a thousand things, because it comes from God who himself is infinite and uncontained. So you can never exhaust the meaning. Nevertheless, as Catholics, we tend to approach the scriptures. You can tell me if this is you or not, or don't, because you don't have to volunteer your spiritual life here. <laughs> We tend to gravitate towards a more practical approach to the scriptures. So often, when we come to a text, say gospel for daily mass, gospel for Sunday mass, where we're reading through the scriptures in our own private prayer, we want to know what does the text mean for me? We want to know what is God teaching me? Generally, that I have to believe, and in particular, especially for me. We want the scriptures to act like oracles for us. What is it that God wants me to do right now? Here are the questions I have in my life. Here are the things I'm struggling with. What does God have to tell me in the midst of that? You can hear this when people express their desire to hear sermons that make the Gospels applicable to our lives, right? People want the daily takeaway, the weekly takeaway, the moral. Again, we might call this a sort of oracular reading of Scripture, Scripture as oracles for us. Of course, these are valuable ways to deal with the Scriptures. They do, in fact, give us practical lessons. They do, in fact, give us instruction. They were called the divine oracles by the ancient Christians. And we do, in fact, find out the will of God for us practically by engaging with the Scriptures. You know, if you happen to be struggling with something and the gospel of the day speaks to you in a particular way, it's not for nothing. Divine providence has arranged this and this is good. Many saints have begun their careers in holiness by hearing the gospel at church and going off and changing their lives. People like St. Anthony of the Desert or like St. Benedict who heard things like, if you would be perfect, go sell all you have and go do this. Right? But there is course, this other way that I would like to suggest. To emphasize seeing as a way of relating to the scriptures is to set aside concerns, at least momentarily, for a practical takeaway. This is verboten in homiletics courses, by the way, right? Because when they're teaching you to preach, they say, the people want a takeaway. You've got to give them something. Give them a practical thing they can do. Give them something they can take home and act on. It's verboten to say there's no practical takeaway. Try writing an article for somebody uh, in, as a priest without having some kind of, well, what do we do about it? But we don't have to always have a practical takeaway. And in fact, I think there is a great value to setting them aside for a while. To see as the way of interacting with the scriptures is to come to the inspired text, in particular the Gospels, with the simple purpose of looking at the Savior. Instead of asking, what does this mean for me? What does the church teach about this passage? What does this parable mean? What am I supposed to take away from this? What does God want me to do? Again, all immensely valuable questions in the right moment. We can instead come to the text and ask simply, Lord, that I may see you. <coughs> and come to the text with this fundamental attitude of saying, how much can I notice about Christ here? Set aside all concerns, all questions, anything of me, and just look at it. Just look at the Lord in whatever text we happen to be considering. Great example might be the passage uh, about the woman caught in adultery. So often when we go through that text, we have lots of questions, right? What's Christ writing on the ground? If you remember this passage, you know, he writes on the ground while the Pharisees say, we caught this woman in the act of adultery. The law says we're stoned her to death. Christ writes on the ground. And scripture commentators go nuts. What is he writing about? What could it possibly mean? Right? When we see the detail of the Pharisees leaving one by one when he says, let him who has no sin cast the first stone, we leave beginning with the eldest. Scripture commentators go nuts. What does this mean? How do we interpret it? When we see the woman come before Christ, he says, woman, 
Are there any left who have condemned you? No one, sir. And neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. How often do we approach that and say, is this how the Lord sees me after my own sins? Does the Lord also say to me, neither do I condemn you. Go sin no more. What does that mean for me that the Lord doesn't condemn me? What does it mean for me personally, emotionally, that the Lord has forgiven my sins? Can I make that resolution to go and sin no more? Right? This is how we might normally approach that passage. And again, there's nothing wrong with this. Very different, though, to approach that passage without asking any of those things. Because notice, none of those questions have told us anything about Christ himself. There are questions about what's the meaning of this odd detail here. How do I feel about what's happening here? How does it affect me? Instead, we can approach that passage and say, what seems to be on the Lord's mind? Who is he talking to? Who is he not talking to? What is he saying? What is he not saying? What seems to bother him? What seems to console him? Who is this person? Instead of asking about all of these other things that concern us, we set those aside and say, Lord, that I might see you more clearly. By doing this, we're beginning to act according to a supernatural logic rather than according to a human logic. When we approach a scripture text with a desire for a practical takeaway, we run the risk of turning Christ into a servant of our daily lives, pressing Christ into service to make our life here in this world go better. And maybe the way in which we want our lives to go better in this world has everything to do with growing in virtue, becoming stronger, becoming better, becoming holier. It's still me, my plans, my desires. If I press Christ into service of my virtues, my growth and holiness, I'm still pressing Christ into service. It's about me. It's human logic still, and not supernatural logic yet. Again, when we hear that phrase, how people will sometimes say that they want the Gospels to be made applicable to their lives, this act of seeing turns the logic the other way. It says not, Lord, how can I make you practical for me? How can I make you applicable to my life? Rather, I forget my life for a moment. I become forgetful of myself. We pray every day in the prayer of the order. And now my life applies to his. I become applicable to the gospel. My life serves the living Christ on his own terms. Not on mine. The gospel doesn't become the servant of our happiness, but we find happiness almost by accident in becoming loving servants of the Lord's own eternity. Interestingly enough, side note, we won't go on too many side tangents. I hope. Uh, but Christ himself taught the disciples to read the scriptures this way. It's really fascinating to pay attention to how does Christ teach the disciples to read the scriptures after the resurrection? That Christ opens the scriptures for, let's say, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and what he tells them is he shows them all the places that his face is hidden in the scriptures. He shows them all the places where his life is foretold in the Law and the Prophets. He teaches them that the fundamental way a Christian, or somebody who follows Christ, should approach the scriptures is by asking the question, where is the Lord? Under which rock is Jesus hiding? And the Lord joyfully says, under all the rocks. Pick up a rock, there's my face. Right? Anywhere in the scriptures. Sometimes we can, uh, you may hear people talk about this as kind of reading things into the Gospels every once in a while around Christmas time when the Messiah is, uh, is, is you know, different people put on productions of Handel's Messiah. You might get articles in uh, different magazines and different newspapers that talk about how this is a totally illegitimate way of reading the Old Testament. There's violence to the Old Testament. It's you know, reading all this in. But the Lord told us to do this. It's Christ himself who taught us to look for him in every possible passage of the scriptures, no matter where we find them. He's the one who taught us to look for the presence of the heavenly city 
in every part of the scriptures. So that's what I mean by approaching the scriptures with seeing. But what does that have to do with the act of worship? This is really interesting because it has to do with how the church uses scriptures. Again, so often because the scriptures often find for us a practical role, we can come to the liturgy of the word, the readings, the gospel, the homily, the responsorial psalm. We can come to that as the moment when we all sit in nice, polite rows and we listen and we learn, we learn something. We're taking in information, we're letting our minds be formed and going away with some new understanding. But if scripture in our, is, is something more than just conveying information, and if our way of relating to the scriptures is more than just looking for practical takeaways, if we approach them in this way of just looking to see, then even the liturgy of the word is something different. It's not just the moment that I sit down and learn something. The connection to worship becomes really clear. Because worship, which we experience primarily in the church as prayer, particularly the Mass, is not primarily about the benefit that I receive. It's not primarily about the takeaway for the day or for the week. Very clearly, if I'm talking about a takeaway, this is not worship. Worship is something else. It's not about drawing down whatever is practical about God for the sake of a better life here. Worship is instead about being drawn up out of myself into an act of loving God for his own sake. Offering my whole self to him in grateful love. That's why the Eucharist is called the Eucharist, right? Evcharisto is still thank you in Greek. It's great. It's a wonderful thing. If ever you want to impress a Greek somewhere, if you're getting a euro or some blocky platter somewhere, and you know they're Greeks, you can still say, Evcharisto, Eucharist. Thank you. They'll say, Paragalo, do you speak Greek? I say, no, I don't. I can speak that word only. That's all I can do. I can pronounce it if you put the scriptures in front of me. That's all I can do. The Eucharist is an act of thanksgiving where it moved by love. I become forgetful of myself and lose myself in looking at God. I lose myself in God's own life and goodness. To be even more specific, the Eucharist is actually... Christ's own act of self-forgetful and loving thanksgiving to the Father, in which we're included and drawn up. It's even greater mystery. This is true not just of that moment, but it's true of the entire Mass, right? We would not want to say that the Liturgy of the Word is reduced to something transactional, where information is given to me, I take it in, then I do something with it. It is that in part. It's good to make practical resolutions when we hear the scriptures. It's good to learn. But the liturgy of the word is the moment when the Lord is revealed to us. When the veil is drawn back and we see his presence. It's the moment when with supernatural sight we look at Jesus. That is to say with Jerusalem eyes. Eyes that see the risen Lord already present here. We look at him and we see him. And in looking at him and seeing him we love him drawn out of ourselves, we're drawn out of our daily lives, which come to rest for a moment, which is a beautiful thing. And we begin to live in eternity even now. Right? And of course, this act of seeing, which is an act of praise, is also an act of changing the world. There are practical effects that come from it. To see and to look is to let something come into my mind and into my heart. With regards to God, this, of course, must mean more than just learning something new about the Lord, but to have his reality, his presence, make its home in me as ruling and governing. If I see the Lord on his terms, as he really is, this cannot but have a practical effect on my life. If I learn to see the Lord in all the scriptures, and I practice looking on him in love, then the entire outside world automatically looks different to me. Seeing Christ with Jerusalem eyes gives me Jerusalem eyes for all the world. And if I see the world differently, then of course I act there. An easy way to remember this dynamic is the ancient axiom that Mother Teresa often used, ubi amor, ibi oculus, which means where there is love, there is the eye. Where there is love, there is the eye. 
Seeing and loving go together. The more we see something, the more we're capable of loving it. And the more we love something, the more we're capable of seeing it as it really is. Which is why, by the way, we only accept what the Lord tells us about who we are. Because only the Lord looks at us with perfect love. If somebody looks at you and they do not love you, they do not see you. And I don't mean that in a new age sort of way, in a kind of self-help sort of way. It's very metaphysical, very real. If somebody looks at you and they don't love you, then they don't see you as you are. Only the Lord can do this. To approach the scriptures with this emphasis on looking and seeing allows us to do this with regards to God. So then, the last thing, to bring things back to our life in the order, what's the effect of seeing God in the scriptures, right? It's it, it's related to obsequium palpetum, which is our other great charism. This is the last thing we'll talk about. It will require more Latin. <laughs> Forgive me. Because again, the words that we choose to use, amazingly, mean something. Choose different words, mean different things. So obsequium, right? Palpitum as well, but we're not going to analyze palpitum unless you really want to. <laughs> if you really want to, we, always, we can always analyze more words. Um, but obsequium, again, is an odd word for service. It's a strange word to use for service. Again, the more simple words would be servizio, right? Very, very simple. Another simple word would be relevio. And those would be probably the most common when it comes to the sort of thing that we're trying to do in supporting the poor. Another one would be sustancio. These words might sound a little <laughs> familiar. This one is, of course, the cognate for service. Relevium is where we get the word relief, right? And then sustancio comes from the same word as sustaining, right? That's where we get that word sustaining. Again, these are not words that we chose. We chose a different one. Servizio, again, comes from that word servus, which is just very simple. We take on the will of the other person as our own. That's it. I become like a slave to whatever it is I serve. In the context of God, this is a good thing. I take on the will of God, hold it entire, and that ennobles me. But this isn't the word we chose for what we do for the poor. Relevium literally means to take up and away the levium, which means weight, right? To relevare is to take a weight off of somebody, to take a weight off of their shoulders, to give them breathing space, right? This is a very practical word. It simply means getting the job done of picking the weight up and taking it off. That is all. It is an act of mercy. But it does not imply a whole lot of relation. You can get it done very easily. Just pick up the weight and move it. Hopefully easily. That's why we go to the gym. Sustencio, again, is a very practical word. Sustencio is the verb for, or the, the, the thing that one does when you provide substance to somebody. Just make sure they have what they need. Right? It's a very bare, practical thing. If I, have, if I perform sustencio, all I'm doing is giving what's necessary, making sure people have it. Again, we didn't choose any of these words. We chose obsequium, which sounds like a cognate that doesn't actually work very well, right? So when we see when we see obsequium, it's never a good thing to be obsequious, right? This is to be uh, really over the top in our toadying, as it were. Right? This is uh, an unpleasant thing for anyone. Anyone in authority has met people who are obsequious. It's really unpleasant to deal with on that side. It's really unpleasant on the other side. I don't think anybody really honestly enjoys being obsequious. Obsequium is not the act of being obsequious. Obsequium comes from the verb sequor, which means to follow or to chase after, to seek, right? 
The sake word means to follow. I promise no lowercase I lie. <laughs> or to chase. Right? That's what it means. And ob is a preposition that means against or in the face of. Right? So ob, I'm looking at somebody face to face. Right? Uh, Latin participles are fascinating for all sorts of reasons. We're not going to go into all of them, but we could, again, if you really want to. Ob means that I am pursuing someone so I can look them in the face. Right? I'm following after someone so as to look at them. It also includes this connotation of yielding to their need, yielding to their will, but it implies this same thing that Tuizio does. It implies a looking. It implies a seeing. It implies a looking for. And it implies relationship that comes from that and charity that comes from that. So if, following the call to practice Tuizio Fide, we approach our whole faith, in particular the sacred scriptures, with that desire to see the Lord as he is. And we practice seeing the supernatural reality of Jesus Christ present everywhere. If we practice looking with Jerusalem eyes, then even the way we relate to the poor takes on that same character of seeking, of searching, of seeing face to face. It's a beautiful thing that these are the nouns we chose as an order to describe our work. We're not just defending the faith simply, we're not just taking care of the poor simply, but we are the ones who look, we are the ones who see, we are the ones who don't turn our eyes away. Right? So that's wrap up. Our mission as members of the Order of Malta and the way in which we properly approach our faith. Scripture is the sacraments, and our beloved Lord is the poor and the sick, it is a mission of seeing, looking, watching, and gazing. It is a mission of seeing supernaturally, with Jerusalem eyes, the presence of Christ, who is the light of the heavenly city, shining out of everything. It's a mission of allowing the one whom we see, Christ himself, whether in the scriptures, sacraments for the poor to draw us out of ourselves forgetful of ourselves in love into him in fulfilling of this mission of seeing practical things will happen we will learn what we need to learn we will act the way we need to act or at least people know we have to and the poor will receive the love and sustenance they need but most importantly the king of the holy city to come will break into the world through our hearts and transform all things according to his likeness. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. The world was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. The world is the Lord. Pray for us. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Any questions? Father, could the, the daily prayer, you know, when we say, Give me the strength I need to carry out this by resolve or get hold of myself. Is that incorporated in what we're doing here? Yeah. So this is this is the nature of uh, this is the, precisely at the heart of this. This question of being forgetful of self is intimately a part of this, right? The reason we are forgetful of ourselves is not out of self denigration, right? The reason that we're forgetful of ourselves is not as an act of uh, of, of Kind of beating ourselves down the reason we become forgetful of ourselves is because we've drawn out of ourselves in charity the one who loves forgets themselves and the one who looks at the one who is lovable begins to love them right looking and loving go together seeing and loving go together and when charity takes a hold of us we become forgetful of ourselves and find the strength to carry out our resolve we're strengthened by the one whom we see the one whom we look in the face. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Any other questions? Any Latin questions? I always do wonder when these Latin phrases are sort of codified mm -hmm. in the order and if they've undergone any changes or if they've always been using the same mm -hmm. phrases. As far
far as I know, they are uh, the old, the oldest form, right? If you look through the rule of blessed Rin Kui, you will find these things, and that's and Rin Kui is the second grand master of the order after Blessed Pradero. So you find this already at the very beginning. I would highly uh, encourage anyone. Somebody gave this to me, um, and I can't remember from the life of me whether it was you, Mary, or whether it was Father Fisher. And I apologize if I got it wrong. But there's a great little book that gives you the rule of Blessed Raymond de Puy with some commentary by, uh, by the Little Red Book, right? Our, our Little Red Book. <laughs> uh, with a commentary from now uh, deceased Father Jerome Bertram. So if you can find that, it's a treasure trove. Lots of good stuff. So I feel like I've heard the term Defensio Fide before. Mm -hmm. Is that a neologism or is that? No, Defensio Fide would be a very old way of talking about Defending. It's an old word, just as old as any of these. They're all you know, well over 2,000 years old. Uh, and you would find defensio fide, like there are, most kings are called defensor fide, right? That's where that term yeah, uh, comes from, uh, where you'll find it used most often. But the way a king defends the faith is very different than the way a religious order defends the faith. There's a story about uh, Louis the IX, uh, which we won't include on the recording, but I'm going to tell you. Uh, so there was a debate, a theological debate between uh, a whole group of. <laughs> <laughs> Who recorded it? If you want, I don't care. Yeah. It's